good evening, everyone. Um, after this very beautiful video, um, I'm very glad to welcome you uh, for this um, very interesting uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, the honor um, to host um, Professor René Provo, who is going to uh, talk to us uh, about his uh, new book. Uh, we also have a very distinguished panel of uh, speakers and discussants. I'm going to introduce them uh, to you in a few few words. Um, and then hopefully we'll have the, uh, the opportunity to, to have a discussion also uh, with the floor. I see now that we are 46 participants, so it's a good amount of people and uh, do feel welcome at the end of this, um, uh, of this uh, Q&A that we'll have with Professor Provo to ask uh, yourself questions. This event takes place within the framework of the IHL talks, which are a series of events organized uh, at the Geneva Academy um, by my colleague, Emily Max, uh, on different topics of international humanitarian law. Um, and so um, this is the last uh, actually uh, event uh, within this framework of, of the year. So now let me introduce you to you our speakers. So first of all, Professor René Provo, indeed, uh, from the university uh, from McGill University um, in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, so he's going to talk about his new book, Rebel Courts, the Administration of Justice by Armed Insurgents, uh, for which you were awarded the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation um, grant. And uh, you are going to um, first talk to us a bit about, um, about the, the, the process and probably about the content of your book. Then we'll have Professor Marcus Assoli, who I, I, I don't need so much to, uh, to introduce Professor Margo Sassoli. He is a well-known uh, world expert on international humanitarian law. He was the director of the Geneva Academy for a few years, and he has published so many books and articles also focusing on the issue of armed non-state actors. Uh, so he will uh, take the floor as well after Professor René Provo. Then we'll have the pleasure to hear about Professor Ellen Duffy, who um, has both a very wide experience as a practitioner uh, litigator. She has um, a huge litigation experiences within in regional and international human rights courts and bodies. And she's also a professor, a professor sorry, of international humanitarian law and human rights at the Grotius Center of Leiden University. We'll then have the pleasure to hear uh, from um, Ezekiel Hefes. Sorry, Ezekiel, um, about the pronunciation of your name. Uh, Ezekiel Hefes is a senior legal advisor uh, at Geneva Call, who you also know as being um, the uh, well known NGO engaging with armed non state actors. Um, Ezekiel Hefes is also part of the research project. Uh, that um, we are uh, leading at the Geneva Academy, for which I'm going to say a few words after. Um, and um, Ezekiel FS has also uh, quite a good expertise, not only on the issue of armed non-state actors, but he will publish in January a book on detention by armed non-state actors with Cambridge University Press. Uh, so he's an expert also on issues of detention. Then we'll have the pleasure also to hear about Mara Refkin, who is a fellow at Georgetown at the Georgetown Center on National Security and the Law um, uh, in, in um, at the Georgetown Law in Washington um, uh, in the US, where she conducts empirical research on legal systems in conflict affected societies. And her research and teaching uh, interests include international criminal law, procedure, international human rights law, um, transitional justice, and military justice. She also holds a PhD from Yale University. So we look forward to, to listen to um, her thoughts on this book, Mara. Last but not least, we have Mina Hadoncic, who is a former Geneva Academy student. She has written her topic 
on the issue that we are going to discuss tonight. Uh, so Mina, uh, we are also um, looking forward to, to, to listening to your thoughts. So um, with that in mind, um, let us start with René. Uh, René, please introduce us to, to your book. Merci beaucoup, Anissa. Uh, first, let me say what a pleasure it is to, uh, to be virtually in Geneva. Well, it's not a pleasure to be virtual, but uh, uh, to engage with people in Geneva, which really is the center of the universe as far as uh, the regulation of the activities of non-state armed groups in zones of armed conflict. And I think the panel is, uh, has a good sample of uh, the kind of expertise that we find in, uh, uh, in Geneva. So the book uh, uh, is on uh, rebel courts. And in the book, I start by ta telling the story of one man, uh, Omar Sakan, who is a Syrian, just an ordinary person who um, grew up, did his compulsory military service, but uh, otherwise had no connection to the regime, was a, an electrician, and eventually was drawn to join the protest against the Assad uh, regime and had to leave because of that uh, Syria to uh, Italy and he returned uh, to join uh, the fight and, and join one of the um, uh, one of the opposition groups and just four days after coming back to Syria and starting his participation in uh, the hostilities in as part of one of the armed groups um, while he was away uh, a, uh, a group of soldiers who had been detained by his group were uh, judged by a panel uh, uh, belonging to the, uh, to the armed group and condemned to uh, be executed for murder and rape, applying the provisions of the Syrian penal code. When Sakan came back, he was told that this had happened, was designated to serve uh, on a firing squad, which he did, uh, and executed one of the uh, government soldiers. He later left uh, and became a refugee in Sweden. And a couple of years later, a video emerged of him executing this government soldier. And he was arrested and accused of murder as a war crime. And thus, uh, for uh, the Stockholm District Court was posed the very, very difficult question of what to do with this. And the book doesn't start, uh, doesn't originate in uh, this case because the case occurred about midway through the six years that it took to complete uh, the project. But it does capture a lot of the difficult questions that the book focuses on. The first is that it does happen. So this is a very common practice, very uh, widespread, long-standing, and yet one which has been basically overlooked um, by, uh, by governments and by international lawyers reduced to uh, mere abuse of authority, one more violation of human rights that uh, non-state armed groups associated often with terrorists uh, uh, are said to have uh, committed. And uh, credit goes to um, uh, Jonathan Soma, who was then a graduate student at uh, the uh, Graduate Institute, supervised, I believe, by Marco uh, Sassoli, who about 12 years ago wrote his uh, thesis, uh, his master's thesis on uh, this phenomenon and uh, wrote an excellent thesis that was published in the International Review of the Red Cross. And this was followed by another very good piece by um, uh, 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 Sandy uh, Sivakumaran. Uh, and both pieces I thought were excellent. And I, as someone interested in legal pluralism where law exists beyond the state was absolutely fascinated by this idea of rebels creating their own courts. And, and that, was, that was more or less it, uh, because I thought that uh, Jonathan and uh, Sandesh had done a very good job analyzing IHL rules. And I didn't know that I had much to add. But eventually it became clear to me that they didn't know what they were talking about in a way. So although excellent academic uh, uh, experts on IHL, they were speaking on a supposition, on a presumption of what the administration of justice might be, but actually 
nobody knew what that corresponded to. And so I became interested in trying to uh, study the actual practice through a series of case studies that form part of what the book is about. So the detailed case studies on the FARC in Colombia, the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the Taliban in Afghanistan, and the various Kurdish groups in Iraq, Turkey, and uh, Syria. So the idea is that this is a phenomenon uh, that is little studied, little examined, but for which I think international law does provide standards that can uh, guide the behavior of armed groups and that can inform the way in which we understand uh, this kind of behavior. And the Sakan case shows how even other countries like Sweden get drawn into these very difficult legal issues although they are not in any way involved in an armed conflict. So this is the project of the book, is to merge a series of case studies uh, done on the basis of um, uh, some field work in different parts of, um, uh, of the world uh, with an analysis that merges international humanitarian law, human rights law, international criminal law, and uh, general principles of uh, international law. The whole informed by um, an approach rooted in legal pluralism that uh, suggests the validity of a very wide ranging uh, vision of what law is. Because of course, if we have a narrow understanding of what law is, none of this is law and it makes for a very short conversation. So I think I'll stop here and let others take the floor. Excellent, thank you very much, Renee. It always, it already starts with some food for thought. So Marco, Professor Sassoli, um, what did you think of the book? What are your impressions? Well, I think uh, rebel courts are the crucial test for a central issue. And I think the most important issue today of IHL, how to make armed groups comply with IHL and whether its rules are realistic and how we can make them more realistic. Our general concern, or at least my general concern, but I share it, I think, with everyone in this panel, um, uh, of uh, keeping international humanitarian law realistic for armed groups is here most conspicuously confronted with the concern for the rights of uh, the accused, who may even be sentenced, as we have seen in the Sakan case, to death. So um, while in many other fields we can say, okay, better some rules than nothing, and we have to be flexible, here there is quite a limit to the flexibility, which is uh, the rights of the accused. And I want to congratulate Ernie, um, we often differ on fundamentals of international law and of law, but uh, here you have written first a captivating book. I must say I read it like a novel, nearly a police novel, uh, based on very interesting field research. And you are right to point out that you are probably the first one also now uh, the Geneva Academy is engaged in a project uh, not specific to judicial guarantees um, with, I think, a very original structure because each of the conceptual legal problems, legislation by armed groups, the question, can armed groups constitute courts and must they even do so under international humanitarian law, judicial guarantees, but also the recognition and the interaction with others, all these conceptual legal problems are illustrated. And uh, I think at least we in this panel agree, developed because um, armed groups also contribute to IHL concerning them. Uh, also the International Law Commission disagrees. Uh, taken one context uh, into account. So 
on each issue, uh, René chose one context. So on the first one, the FARC, then the second one, the so-called Islamic State armed group and uh, the Taliban. Uh, on the third one, the Ta Tamil Tigers. And on the fourth one, the Kurdish groups in Turkey, uh, Syria and Iraq. And all this is done in a very nuanced way. And this is again, um, really uh, a merit because a lot of people uh, dealing with armed groups and sometimes I myself fall into the Stockholm syndrome that we somehow become too nice with armed groups and give a too rosy picture of armed groups and uh, here, René remains uh, purely scientific. This is the object of his study, and he doesn't try to make a case that armed groups do it quite well. He also describes uh, how they do it not well, but this is not a reason to not to engage them and to try to improve. Um, and all this embedded into a theoretical framework, which makes us think about fundamentals of law, of uh, international law, of the rule of law, and of justice in general. And even if one doesn't share René's uh, preferred theory of legal pluralism, one can share, or at least I share, every uh, single conclusion. And uh, this is very important because uh, this is not the kind of book which is only convincing if one agrees with the starting point. But uh, uh, I think it is really a book which is useful for everyone. So congratulations. And I'm looking forward uh, to learn from others in this panel, uh, which are the shortcomings of this book, because uh, uh, I know René, he would be disappointed if we are all speaking like me. Uh, so there must be some criticism. Obviously, I could only say, okay, one could have made research in other situations and on other issues. But I mean, this is unfair because a book cannot be the encyclopedia which closes the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Um... Yes, I, I also uh, look for look forward our discussion. I, I would like to hear now from Mara, and I know Mara from the past, and I have read some of your pieces that you worked on the Islamic State. Uh, so, uh, what is your take on 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 this uh, particular um, issue of uh, you know the rule of law uh, for some armed groups like the Islamic State? Please, Mara. Thanks so much for in inviting me to, to attend and uh, congratulations to Renee on this really important book. Um, uh, I, I think you, you, you're you building a really important bridge here between um, social science and legal scholarship that I think is, is going to be really beneficial for both fields. So in my field of political science, there are many, many descriptive projects um, that have quantitatively mapped out um, the different uh, justice mechanisms and systems of rebel groups, sometimes with quantitative data sets that are helpful for seeing broad patterns over time and space. Um, but those data sets don't tell us more, much more than sort of uh, the binary variable of yes or no, does a, does a rebel group have a justice system um, a, without really eliminating um, variation in different types of justice institutions and in um, procedural differences between them. So, for example, whether or not um, a defendant has the right to a lawyer or appeal, um, which they did not in the case of the Islamic State, um, but but in other rebel justice systems, um, there, there, there are more um, uh, such rights. So, um, and I also think what, you know, a lot of the existing work has missed is um, differences in the quality and legitimacy of rebel legal institutions across different cases, um, which is why I think that the rich uh, case studies you present in the book are, are really such an important contribution and help us um, to, to understand the lived experience of civilians in these areas. So um, in the case of the Islamic State, which you have, I've done a fair amount of research on, um, and I agree with you on your conclusion um, based on the interviews that, that you've done. Um, I've done uh, some, some uh, 
that surveys and other research in Mosul and other areas of Iraq, indicating that many people um, you know, perceive the Islamic State's justice system um, as harsh but fair. Um, and, uh, and I found in Mosul that um, a significant proportion of the population, around 50%, um, thought that this legal system um, you know, and system of governance was um, uh, better or at least less bad than the previous status quo um, under the Iraqi government's rule in terms of uh, the effectiveness of basic services and rule of law. Um, uh, as seen in the reduction of crime that occurred during um, the Islamic State's rule, um, and its courts were generally perceived as faster and less corrupt than Iraqi state courts. Um, and even though, as you note, um, sentences were extremely harsh, um, and, and defendants were sometimes blindfolded and, and you know did not had fewer rights than the Iraqi state courts, including their lawyers, um, there was a perception initially uh, that that the Islamic State at least followed its own rules and applied them to everyone somewhat equally, even its own fighters when they committed crimes against. The civilians, um, at least in the beginning, uh, the earliest period of the Islamic State's rule, which in, in my work I refer to a kind of honeymoon period. Um, I have a couple, the book, the book uh, offers so many insights and raises uh, questions uh, that, that I hope will inspire a lot of new research in this growing field of, of, of rebel governance. Now, I'll just mention too, um, sort of on the extent to which the Islamic State uh, did maintain legality um, or you know, the, the perceived legitimacy of its, of its system, um, uh, so um, you focus mostly on the role of rebel legal systems in the initial success of, of rebel groups um, and in their appeal to local populations who, um, as was the case in Iraq and Syria, have longstanding grievances with state perpetrated injustice, uh, corruption, economic inequality, and therefore they are susceptible to non-state actors that promise to redress those grievances through the, their alternative legal systems. Um, but I think that the legal systems of rebel groups may also play a really important role in their eventual decline and defeat um, if rebel groups over time uh, fail to fulfill their initial promises, um, which are often overly ambitious and unrealistic, um, and if the legality and fairness of their legal systems um, starts to decline, um, which I find evidence that it did in the case of the Islamic State, where um, the, the, um, the group fighters became increasingly indisciplined and courts were also less likely to punish them for misconduct over time, and there were growing reports of corruption, um, and that the Islamic State was committing many of the same abuses it accused the Iraqi and Syrian governments of doing. Um, so I'm curious, um, what, how does your book sort of help us think about um, the, the, the difficulties that rebel groups face in maintaining legality and, and fulfilling their initial promises over time? Um, and then just second question briefly. Um, so uh, you, you talk about the need for states to take seriously the legal systems of non-state actors and, and not um, uh, subject them to sort of a blanket uh, declaration or designation of illegality, which I fully agree with. Um, but I think there are some, some important differences between um, uh, rebel groups like the Islamic State that actually embrace illegality, and that's a really important part of the Islamic State's ideology. It completely rejects the legitimacy of man-made states and international law and isn't seeking recognition. Um, and, and on the other hand, groups like the Taliban that have over time um, moved from a position of initially rejecting internet uh, recognition um, and engagement to um, you know seeing economic and political benefits of uh, participation in the international community and um, and and you know, engaging with uh, it's trying to move closer to compliance with international um, uh, law and IHL as the Taliban is currently do doing by promising to improve you know, uh, women's rights, which remains to be seen whether or not they'll do that. But how, uh, the second question, just how does your book help us think about sort of why some groups um, seem to really uh, be, stay, may, be very committed to illegality like the Islamic State and don't want recognition and why other groups may um, seek it and also evolve over time? So, yes, thank you, Mara. So, illegality or another vision of the law, uh, let's see what uh, René will, will tell us about this uh, rather towards the end of, uh, of our round of uh, intervention here. Uh, so, next speaker on the list is Helen. Um, Helen, you're a human rights practitioner. So, what do you think about um, how armed groups you know, consider the rights of the accused. Can can a court of an armed group actually uphold, um, legally speaking, the rights of the accused or other procedural rights in in um, in, in the process of uh, judging uh, detainees? Uh, 
Well, thanks so much. If I, if I could just say, uh, first of all, congratulations. Um, I think this is really a wonderful book. I think it's um, extraordinarily valuable. Um, and I'd like to say maybe a couple of words about why it's valuable and hopefully I'll, I'll come to your question in, in the course of, of doing so. Um, I'm sorry if I can't be too critical. Marco's invited us to be uh, critical and I'll do my best. I'll certainly throw in a couple of questions or areas where um, I felt perhaps a little more elaboration uh, maybe uh, maybe welcome. Um, I think there's a few things about your approach here in this book that I think is is uh, particularly uh, valuable. And I think uh, one of them is just um, the, the field work, right? So the fact that, that the approach that you've taken here is to do this extraordinary uh, level of field work, which is something that I think is, is very rare. Um, I think, you know, as you've suggested, there has, of course, been some really important scholarship in this in this area, but but that connection of what's actually happening in the field and that is, is often very much uh, lacking. Um, I mean, one of the, the reflections I had on that uh, particular aspect of research really was just thinking that, that um, when we think about uh, some of the securitized laws that are being passed around the world and the, the impact that they're actually having on the ability to do this research, and the ability to actually see what's happening on the ground. I wonder whether we're, we're going to see less of that extremely valuable research in the future or whether that um, is in fact going to impede the ability to do it. I don't know whether that's something that you came across as an impediment, but it certainly is something that I'm seeing in, in my work. Um, I mean, I, I, I think the, what's so important about your approach and to get to, to the question that you've uh, uh, posed um, to me, Anissa, is that, that I think it, the, the pragmatic approach that actually looks at what's happening on the ground, that doesn't ask um, the, the question in abstract as to whether or not it's possible for organised armed groups to meet fair trial standards, but whether or not they are doing so, is I think exactly the right approach. And that's what I like so much about this, about this book. In a sense, it's a real you know, invitation to move beyond those abstract questions to look at how they apply on the ground. Now, there's no doubt, and I think this book actually, although it's refreshing and asking us uh, to take a very pragmatic uh, view, it's also very sobering uh, because you certainly do present in all of the case studies, I think, uh, really the enormous challenges that, that are faced. So, of course, we do ask ourselves about, is there a hypothetical scenario in which these uh, these kind of challenges would not arise and where a fair trial, a thoroughly fair trial is really possible in these kind of contexts. And I'm not sure if we know the answer to that question, but certainly I think the pragmatic approach and a deeply contextualised approach has to be the right one uh, to answering that question. And it's not whether it's possible in the abstract, it's whether or not it's happening um, in practice. Um, Maybe in that sense, um, the, the questions that I have based on what happens in practice um, would be, um, first of all, you know, is it not relevant to think about uh, what armed these uh, rebel courts, as you've uh, engagingly called them, and what is being prosecuted? So not only looking at, of course, you have to look at the essential fair trial guarantees, the nature of judicial independence, the nature of uh, defence rights, etc. But one of the questions, Renee, that I uh, felt you perhaps didn't grapple with, or maybe I missed it uh, in, in what I focused on, was the question of what is being prosecuted? Um, and does it not make a difference to the legal analysis um, whether or not we're talking about prosecutions for war crimes, for serious violations of IHL, but of course we have, uh, we could say a basis in the IHL. And of course, um, by investigating and prosecuting war crimes, you can see indeed uh, the groups can be uh, giving effect to IHL and addressing impunity for war crimes. And is that not very different from what is often happening on the ground. And I'm thinking, you know, the context in which I've dealt with this issue has been specifically in northeast Syria, where I've been advising uh, on the legality of uh, prosecutions by the autonomous authority in, in northeast Syria. Um, and I think one of the difficult issues that, that comes up there, and of course it's one of your case studies, but is the fact that, that so far as investigations and prosecutions are for terrorism, and not for war crimes or crimes against humanity, for example, 
is that not really relevant to the question of legality and um, the fundamental questions really of, of fair trial? Now, of course, we could say that's happening all over the globe. States are, are uh, violating fair trial rights. In my view, they're undermining legality with their definitions of terrorism, etc. Um, but is there is there an issue that we need to look at there so far as there may be a trend towards the prosecution of terrorism, including by organised armed groups? And what will that mean so far as terrorism is often interpreted and applied in a way that means uh, prosecuting opposition, in a sense? Because that is, I think, also a global phenomenon that we see. So does the nature of the crimes matter is something that I really wanted your reflections on, Rainey, and perhaps specifically the terrorism one. And then I think just the other question, and this also goes to the reality of can, can these organised armed groups secure fair trials or not? And of course, it all depends. But I would say, and certainly my focus again has been in northeast Syria and, and in that particular context, where of course the autonomous authority said we want, uh, they announced a year ago, didn't they, that we want to uh, investigate and prosecute in a way that's consistent with the rule of law, but we'll need international support to do it. And so the question then becomes uh, the role of other states. Um, and in my advice, um, I, I certainly said there was no impediment, in my view, to cooperating in order to safeguard fairness of trials. But of course, as we know, states are extremely reluctant um, to do that. Um, Renee, I felt that you went beyond uh, that. And I think you're suggesting that there may even be an obligation on other states to provide cooperation uh, where um, the fairness of trials and the legitimacy of the process really depends upon that cooperation. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about the legal basis for that and the significance of that as, as you see it. I think that's enough from, from me just now, except to say congratulations. I can tell you from my work, this will be used. The only annoying thing about your book is that it came out uh, just after my advice had been submitted but beyond that, I congratulate you, and it's extremely useful. Excellent. Thank you, Helen. Uh, yes, indeed. You know, an armed group judging other armed group for terrorism can can indeed be problematic, and it's uh, it's uh, it's a very good question to ask. Um, Ezekiel, um, as you know, senior legal advisor, as a practitioner, as a scholar. Um, do you think that um, this book, you know, will be useful to your work? Does it match your own conclusions and your own research that you have been doing? Or do you have um, any um, points that might either contradict or not um, Renee's findings? Thank you very much, uh, Anissa. Thank you for putting this panel together and for inviting me to share some thoughts. And, and congratulations, Renee. I think it's a fantastic work. I, I thought, I mean, when I read the piece that you have published on the FARC before, I thought the same. It was very useful for um, the, the research that we are also conducting with the Geneva Academy and, and, and Geneva Call on the practice and interpretation of farm groups on humanitarian norms. And I think this book is definitely going to be a, a, an added value for the literature on, on armed groups from the legal perspective, because as you said, there is um, very little use and reliance on what is actually going on on the ground. So I think that's definitely another value for, for the discussions. I have written down a couple of points. I mean, the first, the first thing, this is um, a thought that I had when I, when I went through your book is what I thought it was very interesting is the way you structure it. So instead of having all the legal discussions at the beginning and then moving to the, the case studies, you actually, you, you, you had all the case studies, I mean, literally you, you discuss the case studies from the beginning of the book and then you included legal discussions here and there. So I thought that was actually quite interesting uh, because it literally, it served the reader to connect the legal discussions with the actual practice that you were you were going through. Uh, so I think that was a, a very positive note. Um, I have uh, three points that I, I would really like to hear your thoughts about. I mean, the first one is when, when doing some research about detention by young groups, some of the, uh, the, the the questions and the inquiries that came about was whether there could be the possibility of create or develop a set of expectations, how armed groups could uh, behave in the future and whether similar groups would behave in a similar manner. So the first question, and I read the methodology and, and why you chose these groups in the introduction, but I would like to hear your thoughts on whether you think that similar groups to those that you have 
analyzed in the book um, would actually do the same or, or, or adopt similar practices uh, as those that you analyzed. Um, then there are two, two questions that I, I, I thought they were quite relevant um, because these are issues that have been discussed uh, in the legal realm in a couple of in the last couple of years. And the first one is the whole discussion about nexus and whether all activities uh, taking place in the territories controlled by armed groups are regulated exclusively by IHL. Uh, because they are uh, related to the conflict, or if there could be activities uh, happening in the territories controlled by armed groups that um, are uh, do not have a nexus uh, to the conflict and are therefore regulated by another body of law. And here you, um, at page 167, for those who want to read this, you you actually adopt the, 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 a, a position in which um, you claim that because non-state armed groups are created, uh, for the purpose of, of um, making war, then everything happening in the territory is controlled by uh, armed groups are regulated by IHL. And this is in line of uh, what the uh, ICRC has said in the challenges report in 2019. So in the last few years, this has been this uh, a, a kind of attention in this field. And um, I would really like to hear your thoughts about this because the way I, I think about this issue is that, uh, I mean, not every armed group is organized in the same way. So I would agree with you with respect to a certain type of group. So there are certain types of groups that definitely they are created to make war and perhaps they don't have civilian wings. They don't provide services or to a very limited extent. And it is clear that the goal is to make war as you put it here. But there are other groups that I think the analysis uh, could be or should be different um, because for instance, they exercise a white territorial control. They have civilian wings. Uh, they have um, they they provide services and and one of the uh, points that you make in the in the in the book is as of course you have um, you have processes that are criminal in nature that might not necessarily be in relation to the conflict but still you make the argument that are regulated by IHL so I think it would be it would be interesting to hear on whether the the uh, the view should be adapt, adapted according to the type of the group. And I thought this was quite interesting because the groups that you analyze in the book are, are highly organized groups. I mean, some of them even exercise in a de facto authority. Um, so I thought it was, it was an interesting point to, to raise in the book. The second one is when you discuss the notion of law. And, and I, I am very much in favor of adopting a legal pluralistic uh, view when dealing with uh, armed groups about this. Um, and at some point, I thought it was, and, and you, you raised it again in the, in the introduction that you, you made in terms of the validity of the law developed by Ambrooks. And you, you say um, that the laws by Ambrooks should be respectful of IHL and human rights law, and which I thought it was actually quite interesting. And you raised the example of non-discrimination laws by the Islamic State. And my point here is whether in your view, the fact that the, the law by the armed group is not respectful of certain human rights law standards or certain IHL standards, let's say of customary IHL or AP2, or AP not common article three, whether that affect the law as a law or, or you know, what's actually the relation between the content and uh, uh, I would say a document produced by an armed group and its consideration as a law. Um, because the way I see it, I, I think there is an argument that could be put forward. And I think you do it in terms of whether the law is more favorable for the population living in those territories than the one adopted by the state or whether those are those laws are protected and, and what's the impact that they have on, on the people that living therein. Also from the jurisprudence of, of the European court, from the Namibia advisor opinion. I mean, there are a couple of things that actually, I mean, follow the, the arguments that you're making. But my question is, is if you if you actually challenge the notion of, of the law because the content is a violation of certain rules of human rights or IHL, and whether you have thought about which rules of IHL and human rights law could be there. So non-discrimination, I, I understand, but states can derogate human rights law provisions from treaties. So I, I wonder if there's some more thoughts there. Um, I think that's it. I mean, I thought it was a great addition. Uh, and, and these points are just because, again, they relate to some of the research I have done. And, and I find that it's it's definitely an added value to have a book dealing both from the legal perspectives and the practical perspectives on, on this. Um, so again, congratulations and, and thank you very much for this.
Thank you, Ezekiel. So I hear you. We have to get a good inspiration from uh, René's methodology and structure for our own research. And I think that's already a good thing for us. Um, so uh, last but not least uh, in this panel, um, let us hear about you, Mina. Um, how, what did you think about Honey's book? Was it useful for your own research, also your own writings? Uh, was it, you know, um, do, is there any limitation to what he wanted to show? What is your take on this, Mina? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Belal, for giving me the floor and, and for inviting me to this panel. I, I must say that it, it is really a true honor and pleasure for me to be participating in this event today and, and have a chance to somehow comment on this book as well. Um, so as mentioned in the in the beginning, I did have a chance to to become familiar with this topic upon writing my LLM paper just uh, just a few months ago under the supervision of Professor Sassoli. And um, I do remember coming to my first consultations in, in mid-March and the professor telling me basically two things. Um, the good news is that there is a book coming out soon on exactly this topic that is going to be very valuable for your research and uh, see the practice of rebel courts. But the bad news is that you will already have submitted your paper by then. Um, so there, I was very excited about being uh, able to read the book when once it is published and being able to compare some of the theoretical findings that I tried to outline in my paper with the reality on the ground. And in total, I could say that this book contributed to revisiting my work later uh, on, the, on this topic in, in three ways. And the first one being enabling me a change in perspective, then providing me with a more in-depth analysis of the law and granting me insight into the practice. Um, as to provide for a bit of a background, in the paper, I was trying to outline how the sliding scale of obligations approach could specifically be applied to the rebel administration of justice. And I identified the main parameters that influence the capacity of non-state armed groups to generally establish governance in, in one form or another. And there I tried to transpose these criteria to establishing the scope of judicial guarantees that would be expected of, of which non-state armed groups. And um, I would say that the key challenge upon conducting this framework uh, that I encountered was that due to the scarce compre comprehensive geography on the practice of rebel courts, I was not sure of how to adequately assess the non-state armed groups capacity, meaning which elements should I account for and, and to what extent um, being sort of a balance between the capacity and the will of non-state armed groups to, to actually grant and uphold these judicial guarantees. Um, apart from that, I must say that the background limitation that I became aware of only upon reading Professor Povo's book was my personal bias and the taking of states as the main reference point as to what is the meaning of notions such as the rule of law, law in general, and courts. Therein, it made me realize that while I did acknowledge and was on board with the debates on how against the state-centric perception, international law needs to deal with the so-called not a cat syndrome, I was constantly trying to make something that is obviously not a cat look like a cat. Um, therefore, the first point that this book enabled me was insight into the need for a paradigm shift in order to effectively tackle the reality of armed conflict in respect of rebel governance. Therein, we see in Professor Provost's book that uh, he calls us to rethink the notions of sovereignty and state monopoly over the creation of the law and how these two interact with the possibility of rebel administration of justice. Further, he underlines a more adequate umbrella approach of legal pluralism, as well as rethinking the content of rule of law that is in line with the actor that is supposed to uphold it, highlighting that although the framework might be the same, the rule of law in national and international terms substantively is not the same. And likewise, the one of non-state armed groups does not correspond to these traditional categories. So when it comes to the legal analysis, the book offers a thorough and comprehensive overview of the position of rebel courts in international law. Um, I believe that it provides a reconsideration of some of the key elements that are prerequisite as to establish the legal frameworks against which we can assess their legality. And here I would like to mm, just highlight some of them. The first one being moving from an understanding of belligerent equality in its formal to one of substantive terms. And there um, further, as, as Ikea mentioned, outlining the nexus requirements stemming from IHL in both its objective and subjective sense and arguing that it is met in all cases when it comes to rebel administration of justice. And the third one being rethinking the limits of the personal and material scope of jurisdiction of such course pursuant to public international law. And going beyond these questions, I believe that the author makes us reach further and think of how different rules of law interact, placing justice governance within the broader realm of international rule of law. And Professor Provost eventually flips the coin of analysis, making us rethink how it interacts with the duties of states, finding that in order for states to act in line with their obligations to first ensure respect for IHL and second secure human rights, they must not only abstain from obstructing the functioning of rebel courts, but also take a positive action that is within their possibilities so as to bring these systems in compliance with international law. 
And ultimately, and I think maybe most importantly, through offering thorough case studies of some examples of rebel justice, I believe that this book helps the reader understand two things. In the first place, that neither armed groups nor their courts are uniform. And the second one being that the shape of rebel governance is not uniform across their area of influence, really fluctuating both across space and time, including in terms of its relationship with the state authorities and the population. And this leads me to my second point, insofar as the book helps get the message across with regards to population agency, looking into how much the population resorts to rebel justice mechanisms in order to address their grievances, both within the population, but also against the actions of the group members. Therefore, I think that Professor Provost's book guided me through thinking what might be reasonably expected from non-state armed groups based on existing practice, and if not giving me a solution, then definitely providing me with food for thought on how differently due process guarantees can be conceived. Um, so having these points in mind and many others that could not fit within these five minutes, I wish to thank Professor Provo and congratulate him on this valuable contribution to the literature on the topic. I would just have one question regarding your view on the interlinks between criminal and civil justice. Because at one point you say at, uh, in the book that the nexus requirement in case of non-state armed group trials is satisfied for IHL in both civil and criminal justice. And then at a different point, you move to state that if the non-state armed group establishes broader governance over an area, administration of justice must be one of its components. And there, you, do you consider that administration of justice should always include both the civil and the criminal component? Or would you, so to say, allow one or the other to remain solely in the hands of the state? And there, when you say that the regimes of IHL and human rights should be braided together, do you believe that they should mean the same in cases of civil and criminal justice? Or would you apply deferring standards when assessing the substantive content of the judicial guarantees that they uphold? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina, for this also thorough review and a very interesting question indeed. I mean, civil justice and the link with, with the link with IHL and the nexus issue is also something that uh, I, I'd be interesting to 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 hear um, about. Um, Rene, we have a few questions from the floor, but I think it, it could be good, I mean, from the floor, you know, from the virtual floor, <laughs> but uh, um, I think it could be good that you have, we have already one round of answers and discussion, and then uh, I will take the questions that uh, have been asked by, um, by our um, fellow, um, you know, co-panelists uh, and the one who are uh, listening in. So please, Rene. Well, uh, thank you all, and uh, I'm uh, uh, delighted and somewhat relieved uh, about how uh, positive you are about the book. It's always, uh, you know, it's, uh, you, it's kind of you and yourself for years, and uh, finally you take it out into the world. So it's a bit of a stressful uh, exercise. And uh, I, you know, uh, Marco, it, there's, a, there's an expression I quote in, I forget where in the book, but it's from uh, Clifford Goretz. A famous legal anthropologist who said that uh, uh, we must learn to grasp what we cannot embrace, and and this was to me a very sophisticated and profound way of explaining to us international lawyers working with armed groups our stance vis-a-vis -vis these uh, these groups. Right, we do have an obligation to understand as profoundly as possible uh, from an internal perspective if we ever are to find ways of generating compliance from uh, groups uh, upon which we have really very little way of leveraging from outside, right? We're already trying to kill them. So it's hard to, well, not us personally, but uh, uh, some people are. So um, it is really important to try to see it from within uh, the group uh, without necessarily accepting the, the legitimacy of these visions but we do have to accept that the reality of these visions, that this is how uh, particular groups approach an issue or, or a practice uh, or the conflict uh, as, a, as a whole. So there is to some extent a mandatory uh, Stockholm syndrome that we must all aspire to, uh, but you know, stepping back and forth between, uh, between it. Um, now, <clears throat> and, and one of, one of the, the pleasures of my academic career over the years has been to disagree with Marco at conferences uh, about issues of I, IHL. So you, I found you were exceedingly gentle uh, in your introductory remarks. So I'll invite you to, um, uh, 
uh, uh, to bring out the knives uh, as well, if um, uh, if you will. Now, um, uh, Mara Refkin, for for people who don't know, uh, is someone who has uh, uh, who has carried out in incredible field work. It's really uh, I've I've done some. I've done enough to know how how daring and dangerous uh, some of what Mara uh, has done. And I say that knowing that it always looks more dangerous from abroad, from far away. Uh, and indeed that's part of the difficulty is that you, it's hard to know whether you should go in the first place uh, or not. But even having gone uh, to, um, uh, to, to Northern Iraq, uh, I think that uh, I actually kind of was worried about uh, some of what uh, Mara uh, did. And there's a, uh, perhaps a message to, to the academics uh, listening in, uh, in this kind of incitement to weave um, empirical work field studies into uh, the analysis of uh, international law and international humanitarian law in particular, uh, is that we, we have to be wary of encouraging students to somehow believe that it will all be okay, that nothing's bad going to happen to them. Uh, and, and it's a very um, difficult exercise to determine whether it is safe enough to go to a, a zone of instability. It's really hard to know from thousands of kilometers away uh, because that kind of information does not travel uh, well. So we, we do have a responsibility to provide guidance, um, often without necessarily having done this work ourselves which puts us at, at a disadvantage, right, to give this advice. But this is, I think, a collectively uh, legal academics in IHL have this, uh, uh, this duty as more and more doctoral students uh, carry out uh, field work. Um, for returning to, to Mara, and, uh, so, you know, the, the art of justice over time, uh, I think it is a fair critique. And, and in some ways, uh, it reflects a political science sensibility that is less central to a legal analysis. And, and it's in that way that, although I might uh, uh, aspire to interdisciplinarity, I've always tried to remain kind of the jurist because that's, I, I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, not really competent to, uh, to be a poly political scientist or an anthropologist or, or all of these uh, other things. And, and you know, some of the questions that the political science research does ask, which lawyers don't ask, um, and there is recent work on uh, uh, on group justice, which uh, uh, I think is really uh, interesting, is to ask, you know, when, when are groups likely to create courts? Uh, or uh, does the administration of justice help to win the war, right? Does it support the insurgents? These are things that lawyers don't tend to ask. These are questions lawyers don't tend to ask, right? We just say, you know, well, if you do this, then, you know, this is the legal characterization that, uh, that apply. So the art of justice, I think, is, is an important question, but one which I will defend myself by saying it, it's, it's perhaps more of a poli-sci question than a, a legal question. I'm skeptical of, of your statement that ISIS embraced or embraces illegality. I, you know, that's certainly not what they say, right? They claim pure, like the, the purest form of, of Sharia, um, unmodified by <clears throat> modernity and, and other, you know, corrupting practices as they describe it. And um, it speaks to, you know, whether they call it law or not reflects the um, ambiguous place of law in Islamic thinking generally, right? If you look for law in the Quran, it's a, it's a hard job, right? Because it's very dispersed, it's all over the place, not identified as such. And so there is a, um, it, it reflects a, a, a more profound questions about, you know, what do we mean by law and the, the universal validity of a single concept of law that animates international law for, for us international lawyers, um, it, which poses a challenge that is not necessarily so central for a political scientist, right? Because for you, what's law is, is you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of international relations scholars don't really believe in international law to begin with. So 
you know, it doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, change so much. But th there is a difference, you know, with a group that embraces governance on the basis of uh, uh, established norms, right? And whether you label them law or not, well, then it becomes a, a semantic uh, uh, and kind of ontological uh, or philosophical debate, as opposed to uh, other groups like the Lord's Resistance Army, which for my impression, I have not studied them in depth, but they appear to be much more predatory in the relation to the civilian population than uh, a group like ISIS, which doesn't mean they're less violent or anything like that. But uh, it reflects this idea of um, the importance of the narrative of uh, justice as a central element of the rule of law that I argue as uh, one central element of a rebel rule of law in my first paragraph. Um, uh, moving to Ellen, Helen, um, so uh, I, I, I've, the impact of secur securitization law and the ability to carry out research, absolutely. And this is again, uh, for us uh, professors supervising doctoral students in particular, I think uh, raises hard questions. And we have uh, kind of one example of this hardening is uh, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, a decision of the United States Supreme Court that was extremely restrictive in um, uh, 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 labeling as support for terrorism, training in international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And, you know, it's an absurdity, uh, you know, in, in the most obvious way. But, you know, this is a phenomenon that is, I think, uh, globalized. And uh, I, I think that it, it becomes part of our uh, horizon as to you know, how we organize research. What is being prosecuted is an absolutely central question. And um, you're, I think that it's a fair critique to say that I, I might not have given it the significance that it could be taken to have. And I, I, um, I'll admit, perhaps uh, I'll be reluctantly, that there's a space there that there's, there's maybe a haze that, um, that could benefit from, uh, uh, from uh, being clarifying. I do talk about the concept of jurisdiction of rebel courts, including um, territorial jurisdiction, but also uh, jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction, in which I do talk about the legitimacy of armed groups to criminalize providing information to the enemy, which is one of the most frequent um, uh, uh, prosecuted crimes and typically the most harshly punished and also the most frequent occasion for violations of due process guarantees, right? This is, for example, a FARC commander I was interviewing was telling me about you know, how they approach their uh, uh, justice issues. And I said, yeah, but what about, you know, sapos, right? Informants who, who give information to the government. And he says, no, that's, that's different. They, they're completely out of that picture and they just basically, they, they get shot and, and killed. And, and that's quite a frequent uh, thing. Of course, that does not answer the question of whether they can be prosecuted before an independent and impartial tribunal offering fundamental guarantees. The fact that they don't do it doesn't answer the question of whether they, they could uh, in principle. So, so the question is what they do and, and, and what they can do legally is, is always in, in conversation. And, and the fact that they might not respect it uh, for certain categories doesn't stop us from asking questions because uh, we want to be able to tell these groups what to do. And then I'll come to that when I answer Ezekiel's uh, a comment more uh, specifically. Um, uh, can a fair trial really happen is, um, you know, I mean, that's often the first line of defense uh, to, to kind of reject offhand the, the validity of the whole idea is that, well, you know, even if they, you know, even if they did set up courts, they, at the end of the day, you know, the, the Taliban, it's not, it's not just, it's just not going to be fair. And um, I'm, um, I'm skeptical uh, of this idea. Uh, I'm skeptical first because um, it is measured against a standard that is itself merely an aspiration. 
and which we should not take as a minimum threshold. So there's a little bit of double speak here where we admit that, well, state justice, yes, there's also sorts of problems, blah, blah, blah. And then when we say, okay, what should rebel justice be? Well, we have this super high threshold, anything less than that, well, obviously it's not gonna be real justice. So, you know, when you, you compare the, the courts in Rojava in Northeastern Syria run by the, the Kurdish led administration, you know, you gotta compare them to the Syrian government courts. And really, you know, that's an enlightening comparison. And, and so we have to take into consideration the fact that this is happening in conflict zones with groups that are not states that have limited uh, resources. Uh, should or, or could state uh, provide assistance? You say you don't see an impediment. Um, is there a duty to help? And you, you invited me to, to respond. Uh, I think the, the interesting example there is France and their stance vis-a-vis -vis French nationals who joined uh, ISIS as foreign fighters in uh, Syria who are detained by uh, the uh, uh, administration in Rojava. And um, the, the French foreign minister, uh, Le Drian, uh, said that uh, he wishes these people to be um, judged locally. And uh, he's wonderfully ambiguous about what he means, but we know he doesn't mean the courts of the government of Syria. And we know he means the courts, the Kurdish uh, courts in Rojava. Now, then, then we become into, we get into really technical human rights uh, law about how to define human rights jurisdiction under the, uh, both the European Convention and the ICCPR. And whether the fact that these are French national, which has been found to play a role in jurisdictional analysis by uh, the uh, Committee on Rights of the Child recently, actually, um, the fact that, you know, France is not a part, right? They, the, the Kurds have said many times they would like nothing more than to get rid of these people, right? Please, French, France, come and get your nationals and, you know, we'll give them to you. And France is in a way indirectly delegating to, to a non-state armed group the prosecution of war crimes by its own citizens. So for me, this is starting to, you know, build elements that go towards human rights jurisdiction and then if we ask the question of, well, how does the duty to ensure respect in IHL kind of intersect with human rights law? Well, probably in, in IHL, we're not gonna be so demanding as human rights is to have human rights jurisdiction. I think the duty to ensure respect is looser in the way that it's been generally interpreted and it would be unjustified to, to harden the requirements in a context like this. So my interpretation is that there's a case to be made that France has actually an obligation to provide support to the Kurdish courts in Rojava to help them uh, be fairer. And God knows they can use the help. And I think that they would welcome the help uh, in this respect, right? That certainly was my impression of uh, the Kurdish authorities in uh, Iraq who were pleading for international support to prosecute uh, a genocide against the Yazidis uh, of some of the people that they at the same time deny holding. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, there, there's receptivity there. So it's a, a really interesting uh, issue that on the whole governments are entirely uninterested in having a conversation about, right? Governments don't want to, nobody said that, but governments, don't agree with any of this uh, on the whole and, and don't want to be any part of this um, uh, 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 understanding. For Ezekiel, um, maybe I'll just mention that uh, uh, on, on the methodological uh, aspect. So I had uh, uh, one of my many research assistants who, um, who read um, all the research memos on all the groups, even those that didn't uh, end up uh, in, um, uh, in the book as a specific case studies. And then he, there was a kind of a, an outline of the entire book for legal issues. And he did a mapping exercise of, you know, looking at everything anyone has found on every group and asking, does it connect to anything that groups do? And so at the end, I had this, this huge document 
that uh, for every issue, right, the right to counsel uh, as a due process guarantee. And then, you know, we have stuff from the FMLN, which is not one of the case studies, and from whatever, the SPLA, and from... So it's, it's a really um, a difficult but interesting methodological exercise to try to do this kind of uh, weaving. Uh, coming to, uh, yeah, can you generate expectation? Well, I mean, there's definitely kind of a Geneva call aspect to, to all of this, right? Because we want to generate compliance, meaning we want to convince these people to behave in ways that are more aligned with human rights standards than, than they do otherwise. Uh, if not, we should stop being lawyers and, and we should just all join uh, Mara in the poli sci departments. So if we think it matters whether something is, is legal or not, and it should provide guidance, then how do we reach uh, armed groups? Well, of course, Geneva called the ICRC and, and some other groups have been you know, engaging with armed groups for, for decades, for, for a long, long uh, time, but not on this issue. So should there be a deed of commitment on uh, the administration of justice? Well, in, in a way, there, there must be, right? If there isn't one by Geneva call, because I presume that it would really piss off governments if that were added to the list of deeds of commitment, because how to annoy a government is to suggest that uh, armed groups can administer justice is a frontal assault on, on sovereignty, as far as, as all governments are concerned, I believe. Uh, but, um, but, you know, we, we have to put it in the vernacular of particular groups, right? And so, and this connects to, to something Mara has said as well. So, so for the Taliban, right, we have to translate it not just into Pashtun, but into Sharia as well, right? And so there is a profoundly transcultural or intercultural dimension to this project that I, I didn't go into, right? I have another book on the impact of cultural diversity on IHL that I've been writing for 22 years now. And uh, I, I have not finished yet, but um, it's it's sort of in between the lines of, of this book. Um, but I, I just it was already too too big a book to to go uh, into it. The nexus is is one where uh, it is it is really a complex issue, and it's one where I I actually cite Marco to disagree with him because I, that was really fun, and. Um, because at some point he says, well, you know, if there's a theft of a cow, um, then, you know, there's no nexus uh, to the conflict. And, and so I, I, I gave the example of the theft of the cow to, to disagree, to say that uh, while it's true that for a government administering justice, you know, life goes on, right? So cows get stolen and, and people get prosecuted uh, for the theft of a cow and, you know, has nothing to do with the conflict. There's no reason to apply. IHL. My argument is that um, the, the existence of armed groups is tied to the conflict. That is how, that is why we label them legally as armed groups to which IHL applies. And so they do not have an existence separate from the conflict as far as law goes, which is very different from states, which do have an existence apart from the conflict uh, as far as law goes, right? The Montevideo Convention and, and all of that. So, so there are really very different legal uh, constructs. And the, the fact that some armed groups don't have civilian wings, right, that, uh, is true. But to my mind, that is not a, a legally uh, central uh, point of distinction. And I'll just make an, another point that you don't make, but I, I talk about the targetability of judges under IHL because one of the fascinating things I found is that um, so in Afghanistan, um, uh, judges, Taliban judges were labeled high value targets by the coalition forces, well, by the Americans, uh, really. And, and it begs the question, you know, oh, yeah, okay, so could you target judges? So, so this has an impact, for example, on the right to a public trial. Uh, if you can target the judges legally, then you know it, it, it does inform uh, the right uh, of the accused to a public trial. But um, I argue that judges should not be targetable because judging is not direct participation in hostilities. 
uh, which to my mind is not a contradiction with saying that what they do has a nexus to the conflict under IHL. It's, it's a subtle distinction. And I was afraid people would get confused. So I did my best to explain that this wasn't quite the same thing, but it's, it's easy to, to, to and, and these are not disconnected, right? Admittedly, these are, these are, there's an overlap between these, uh, these concepts. Um, uh, da, de, da, de, da. Yeah, uh, notion of law, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and, and, and not uh, using up all the time without letting some of the comments from uh, the people who were not on the panel. Um, I, maybe just to, to go to a point by Mina uh, about the link between criminal and uh, civil justice uh, that's also connected to nexus uh, to the conflict. So, so again, you know, the theft of the cow or really a common thing, you know, the neighbor's cow, you know, came over and trampled my field. And then, you know, they bring this to the local commander and say, you know, do something or otherwise I'm going to take my shotgun and I'm going to, you know, do justice for myself, which is something no armed group wants, right? So armed groups don't like instability in area over which they have authority. So they have a vested interest in managing everything that interferes with stability. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it's uh, to me, uh, there is civil justice, you know, family law, um, you know, alimony payments. These are this happens all the time before rebel courts. But uh, because of uh, the IHL standards in the Geneva Conventions and protocols that are really focused on criminal prosecutions, uh, human rights uh, IHL lawyers have been focused on criminal law, uh, and and I think that it's a, an error. And and we really and I. I did my best. I, it's one of the parts of the book I'm less satisfied with. I wish I had more to say about civil jurisdiction. And, um, uh, uh, you know, others have written, uh, interestingly, uh, I think, uh, about this um, uh, uh, recently. And um, so, uh, but in, in principle, I, I maintain my stance in, in answer to, uh, uh, to Ezekiel that um, everything a rebel court does including ordering alimony payments is related to the conflict. And so IHL does apply. Of course, there's no nexus for human rights law. So, you know, we're not troubled by that aspect. And, and the whole thing is, is an interplay. I mean, there's a kind of an over-representation of IHL people uh, perhaps on, on the panel, uh, but, uh, you know, human rights is, is equally important to all of this. So let me stop here. Excellent. Thank you very much, Hane. So we can expect a rebel court number two, right? That's what you're saying. <laughs> okay, so um, we have a few minutes for, um, for, for the very interesting questions that have been asked by, by um, those who are following us online. I will try to summarize them. Um, a first question by uh, Roberta Arnold, um, who is asking you uh, somehow um, if there, there is a possibility of also overseeing um, what armed groups are doing. So I'm going to rephrase just a bit one of the one of the questions. So she says domestic prosecutors are subject to the scrutiny to the scrutiny of surveillance bodies. What about those prosecuting on behalf of a non-state actor? What about the enforcement of sentences? And so it's a, it's a question coming from a practitioner because um, she was also a former prosecutor. So, so she wants to know about, you know, how can we oversee also the work of, of, these, um, of these figures in armed conflict? I'm going to ask the question one by one and perhaps so then we can, you, you will be able to answer them. So the second question is a question that actually I get a lot from my students is about the, the, the rule um, nebis needem. So should domestic courts recognize prosecutions and judgments of rebel courts on a domestic level with regards to the prohibition of double jeopardy? Um, in other words, how likely is it that domestic jurisdiction will consider judgments ruled by non-state courts? So this is by Isabella Poo, I, Poo, I know, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. A question by John Nucciarone, who is telling us, so, um, 
so let me try to, to summarize it as well because these are long questions so so i'm going to read it um the idea of giving legitimacy to the legal process of non-state actors like the islamic state is difficult to accept but it would lead one or so he at least to give importance to things such as how non-state actors conduct themselves when judging the other side should be used as evidence if and when they are put on trial, whether by a government or international tribunal. And two, how important is it to ensure the West holds itself to high standards when using force, for instance, calling in drone strikes or when judging the conduct of their own soldiers. And just as importantly, to ensure our review processes are open, transparent, and fact-checked at different stages. Um, then we have uh, another question by Fabian Wilches, who asks us, who asks you, if the administration of justice by armed groups would change depending if they have control over territory or not, because some armed groups have control over territory, and but but and then institute courts but then you have also armed groups that do not control territory and how then this would work um then we have one question by olivia herman who asked us what can be ways to influence non-state armed groups to uphold fair trial standards and other principles such as impartiality neutrality independence in their administration of justice and last but not least, um, Carson Thomas asks you, during your uh, field work, did you encounter armed groups whose courts considered issues of taxation by the armed groups, e.g. Pe pecuniary demands made and enforced by armed groups upon the local populations? Given the importance and often sophistication of such financial arrangements, I wonder if related disputes are ever educated by the courts of the armed groups. And then Mara has also, you know, answered you um, your question, but I, I will leave this um, for, for later if we have the time. So these are uh, the questions that I see. Um, yes, I think I've asked all the questions. Okay, so, so let me offer some, uh, uh, some comments. So, uh, uh, oversight of uh, the administration of justice speaks to, you know, the solidity of governance and, and the extent to which uh, it, it is realistic to think that uh, an armed group in a conflict zone can meet the rigorous demands that flow from uh, 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 due process guarantees, in particular human rights in general, NIHL, uh, about things like the independence and impartiality of, uh, of a court. So, the, you know, there are, um, so uh, there are two ways of answering this. The first is to say, these standards have to be adjusted to the fact that these are not states, right? It is clear that if we put on armed groups demands uh, that were designed for states. In fact, standards that are a reflection of what states do, um, then obviously there's going to be a mismatch, right? So state justice, uh, due process guarantees are in many ways a description of the way states administer justice. And so unsurprisingly, they are very state-centric. And when we shift to look at what other uh, processes for the administration of justice uh, do, whether it's rebel courts or whether it's, you know, things like the gachacha uh, in post-genocide uh, Rwanda or the very many uh, customary uh, tribunals in uh, uh, large parts of Africa that handle, you know, a, a vast majority of, of uh, uh, legal uh, disputes. Uh, these standards don't make any sense. So there has, we do have to uh, translate these legal standards from state-centric to uh, reflect the nature of the actors and also of the context in which they, uh, they operate. And I, I remind everyone, of course, that uh, due process guarantees are not non-derogable standards directly under international human rights law. Uh, and so this is a, a matter of contention within human rights law. Uh, and I won't get into the, the technical side of that. But um, 
it's so it is acknowledged at least to some to some extent that uh, a state of emergency uh, with war as the ultimate state of emergency uh, is a, a condition in which governments themselves acknowledge that well yes we might have to to make uh, adjustments and looking at the practice of uh, military courts uh, on the battlefield uh, is something that I've done a few times in the book as an interesting parallel to reflect at least the context, uh, if not the actor. So, um, so the, the standards have to be adjusted. Uh, is it, um, uh, let, let me start by, you know, how do we oversee the enforcement of sentences? That's the easiest part. Sentences are really, really complied with because um, those are armed groups that on the whole are, uh, don't hesitate to resort to extreme violence very quickly. So it is just not a good idea to disregard the decision of the rebel judge, because you, know, you, you, you might end up uh, with a bullet in the head, literally. So there's a, an extraordinarily high degree of compliance uh, on the whole for decisions of rebel courts, much higher than of state courts. Uh, I might uh, I might say places like Afghanistan, a state court judgment means really not much, but a statement, a judgment of a Taliban court, on the other hand, now that you disregard at your peril. Uh, staying in Afghanistan uh, is an example of how there is a possibility of oversight. So uh, there, um, uh, uh, there's a, a, a a French uh, uh, social scientist, uh, Adam Basco, who's done fantastic work on the Taliban, uh, has published his book in, in French, but uh, he's, he tells me he's working at translating it. And um, uh, his um, research suggests that uh, the, the judges are independent of the local commanders and that the, the one is used against the other has a check uh, and balance mechanism so that local villagers in principle can complain about the commander to the judge and about the judge to the commander. Now, whether it actually always works in this way is you know, probably a, a question to be verified. It's unlikely that it always uh, works, but there are mechanisms uh, that do exist uh, that do provide for uh, the possibility of uh, oversight. Now, um, uh, Nebis uh, uh, in Idem, uh, Isabel Pugh's question, uh, or, or, or double jeopardy uh, is, a, is really an important question. Uh, it also relates to issues like complementarity uh, uh, with the International Criminal Court in relation to a decision of a rebel uh, court, something I have a little bit of fun uh, with uh, in uh, chapter four. The, part of the problem is that the, 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 the legal concept of uh, double jeopardy or nebis in idem is fuzzy, right? There's very little agreement as to what it demands under international law. And um, it's normally taken to have a really quite narrow ambit of preventing prosecution for the same crime before the same jurisdiction. Right, so the same state prosecuting the same person for the same crime twice. Now, the question then becomes, are rebels the same jurisdiction as the state, right? So were the Tamil Tigers the same jurisdiction as the government of Sri Lanka? Uh, I, I, I think that's not really a defensible position to claim that they are, right? I think the, uh, these are distinct jurisdictions. So the, the principle, the human rights principle itself of Nebis in Idem doesn't prevent uh, double prosecution before the rebel courts and state court, um, whether it's one way or the other. And, you know, we see that in the United States, for example, where double jeopardy does not apply uh, to prosecutions before state courts and federal courts, right? To, if you can get prosecuted before both sets of courts for the same crime, well, for the same action, that will you know, be a, a state crime on, in one way and a, and a federal crime in a different way. So with that example, we see that states themselves have a very flexible, let's say, uh, a definition of what is a violation of um, the Nebis Idem uh, principle. Um, uh, 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 for for uh, John, 
So with the example of ISIS, of course, ISIS is the sort of, uh, is the, the provocative example, right? It's like you talk to people and they say, yes, but surely not ISIS. And, and I find that interesting because, you know, we say that in the West, but, you know, in a way that's because we're exposed to the kind of narrative about ISIS that Colombians are exposed to about the FARC domestically, that the Sri Lankans are exposed to about the LTTE domestically, right? It's, it's just that we, we're, not, we're not the target of the narrative for these other groups as we are for ISIS and the Taliban. And, but all these other groups are always described as terrorists, murderers, rapists, uh, crazies, uh, you know, they, so, 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 so a first comment. A second is that if we don't do what I say we should, right? And what I think international law demands of us, we, we basically give up on doing anything significant as lawyers, right? So if we, unless we say that we want to regulate the administration of justice by armed groups with international legal standards, we deprive ourselves of our basic tools and we have nothing to say to ISIS apart from, you know, I don't know, morality claims, I don't know. Uh, so obviously this, there's a precondition that we see that this is applicable in order for us to, uh, to, to have a critique that is incisive and that can uh, orient uh, behavior. Uh, for uh, Fabien, uh, control of territory. Now this is another panier <laughs> uh, de um, crab. Uh, the expression escapes me in English for, for now. Uh, 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 there's another kind of a messy issue in spider I, net, spider net, or something. It, yeah, something <laughs> like that. Um, so the, the, I, I do a little bit of deconstructing of the notion of territory in the thesis because I, I'm critical that uh, of the way that lawyers tend to talk about territory as if it's a thing, and and in fact it's not a thing, right? It's a construct. It's not land, and um, and in some ways it's very difficult to make the argument that some international lawyers make that control of territory is a precondition to the administration of justice. This is inspired by uh, Article 1 of Protocol 2 that uh, imposes as a condition for the applicability of Protocol 2, doesn't translate to Common Article uh, 3, which is otherwise also applicable even to conflicts to which Protocol 2 applies, and people tend to forget that bit. Um, uh, if I can be the... Uh, uh, that the formalist international humanitarian lawyer for a moment. So um, uh, uh, legal, the legal argument is skeptical. Uh, on the other hand, context matters, as I, I have repeated several times, and um, territorial control changes uh, what we should demand of armed groups, because you can do more when you have stable control of uh, territory. Uh, I think I don't have time to answer about taxation, but Mara is really the person that knows much, much, much more than I do about that. So I will uh, defer to, uh, to the answer that she's given. Okay, excellent, Rene. Um, yes, you're right on time. And uh, thank you very much for all of you to, to, to keep that um, in mind. Um, I will leave you uh, the last word by asking you one last question, but an easy question. Um, Honey, I would like to know uh, which part of the book, which chapter uh, you enjoyed the most writing about and which one was the most challenging? Mm. And with that, we'll, we'll, we'll have the last words for this. Evening. Okay. Okay. Well, um, let me start by, so, so chapter three on due process is the one I wrote last because I was kind of dreading the, um, you know, the minutia of due process guarantees and you know there's like a mountain of human rights law to to deal with and you know inter-american courts in europe and uh, the iccpr blah 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 and, and and i'm not i don't tend to do a lot of that kind of international law i'm more of a structures guy than you know the little picky things and uh, so i uh, kind of had to beat myself to to get through that uh, and um uh, to do that and this is connected to the LTTE chapter which was extraordinarily difficult even though the LTTE probably had the biggest practice right a decade 
they say, you know, 30,000 decisions of LTT courts with a complex structure, uh, and they had their own law school. Um, so it ought to have been the easiest, and it turned out to be the most difficult, in large part because the Sri Lankan government was really effective at destroying all remnants uh, of that and terrifying anyone who, uh, who could talk about it. The most uh, fun, I think it's chapter four, uh, about the what I call the rayonnement, and uh, because it's s s somewhat counterintuitive, and, and things like the exploration of the ways in which even the territorial state itself, uh, you know, even Sri Lanka has to deal with judgments of the uh, LTTE courts in ways that is unacknowledged in Sri Lanka itself. And, and likewise in Colombia, where judgments of um, FARC um, uh, commanders were written into uh, the decision books of uh, local authorities and it's kind of fed into the official legal system. To me, that was the most subversive aspect of uh, rebel court, if, if the uh, statement isn't too contradictory. Uh, and, and I enjoyed that uh, very much. And no, they, I, I'm not planning for a second edition. It nearly killed me <laughs> to, to finish the first one. No, I, I was teasing you. But thank you very much, Rene, for this. So I, I really um, encourage all of you to, to read uh, this fantastic book. Um, you know, uh, as Marco put it, it's uh, as easy to read as a criminal novel. So you can John read it Grisham. over. Yes, exactly. So you can read it during your Christmas break. Uh, you'll have fun. But uh, um, Joke Apart, it's, it's a great book, which uh, is very useful for those working on this issue. And it will, it will be very useful for us, Ezekiel and Pascal Bonga and the Geneva Academy, uh, Geneva Core, which we are working on, on a similar um, topic. So I wish we'd had more time to discuss. Um, thanks to all of the panelists who also, you know, took uh, the time to, to comment on your book and to ask questions. Um, I see a lot of thank you, congratulations from uh, the people uh, following us online. Our heartfelt congratulations, Rene, for this great work that you have done. We are really happy that you've been able to go in the field and to interview the armed groups. This it's really is a gift to us, for us researchers on this issue. So with that, uh, I bid you all farewell and have a nice afternoon, evening uh, for those who are in different time zone. Um, and uh, I, I think we are going to continue the conversation one way or another on this fascinating topic. So have everyone a good evening. Thank you.